If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We are going through the book of Revelation verse by verse and line by line. And just the title of the church alone here is says volumes. The dead church. The dead church. And folks, not all churches are alive. Okay? I thank God that we are not a dead church. Folks, you have watched the baptismal waters move these last six weeks. It's amazing of what God is doing here. Our church is alive, and our church is blessed by God. And we need to give God the credit for that. It is God doing this. It is His Holy Spirit. People ask me every week, what are y'all doing over there? And I tried to tell them, we are just following God and following the Holy Spirit. But we are in revival. I, I know our uh, Bible conference and revival starts next week, but we decided to start about six or eight weeks early, and I thank God for what He is doing. So today we're looking at the title of the, uh, the dead church. And folks, we know what dead means, okay? It means lifeless. There's no life in it. Uh, people are going there, but not, you know, not much is happening. Uh, it's kind of like punching the clock and going to church. We're going to church because we are supposed to go to church, all right? And, and uh, a lot of times in dead churches, they don't even realize they're dead. And Jesus, in this part, you have to realize most of the Scripture that I'll share with you today, it's quotes from Jesus Christ himself. And it's not me judging a church or judging others' churches. It's what Jesus said is going on. And he says, this church in Sardis was dead. And, and it was, uh, did not have the life that he wants. He has come, the Bible says, to give us life and to give us abundant life. And so it is up to us. Dead churches are full of individuals. And you can be a Christian in a dead church. That doesn't mean that all people are lost there. But the bottom line is, folks, in every church, there are saved people and there are lost people. And the lost people sometimes don't even realize that they are lost according to the Word of God. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along, the dead church, number one, there are two kinds of people. Two kinds of people. And I'll just tell you, there's, there's, there's lost people and there are saved people. Two kinds of responses. Not everyone responds to the, the Holy Spirit and to God the same. There are people who choose to ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit, to ignore the Word of God, and there's others that are hungry for the Word of God. And then two kinds of results. And folks, I'm telling you, the Bible is extremely clear on this. There's only two places you are going in eternity. The only two, two choices. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. And folks, we don't want to talk about hell. But just ignoring something doesn't mean you're not going there. The Word of God plainly tells us what it takes to go to heaven. And I pray today, if there is one person here that doesn't know Jesus Christ, today will be their day of salvation. So let's look at two kinds of people. The dead church. Revelation 3. And by the way, Sardis was the capital of Lydia and an important city in Asia. Uh, it was located 50 miles east of Ephesus. There were four main roads that went through Sardis because it was the center of trade and had a military center there. It was built on a large plateau, so it was extremely hard to attack. The, the main religion was the worship of Artemis, but there were also pagan gods there, Greek philosophy, mysteries, cult, and idol worship. Sardis was a wealthy city where gold and silver coins were created and much jewelry was made and sold there. Hot springs were an attraction uh, outside of the city of Sardis. There was a huge earthquake that destroyed most of the city in A.D. 17. Sardis never regained its life, and the church there was a dying church. It is a tragedy how Satan can tear up a church 
and make it a dead church in a short amount of time. But the biggest tragedy is people dying, not having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and spending eternity in hell. So let's look at the dead church and to the angel. And again, the, the book of Revelation was sent to the pastors and the pastors in the churches read it to the specific churches. In Sardis write, These things, says he, who has seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And again, in this part, you heard this in chapter 1. Okay, we, we explained that the seven spirits of God is, are, are listed in Isaiah 11 too, and it's a culmination of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and all that's listed there, folks. I'm telling you, I thank God for the Holy Spirit. I thank God that Jesus told his disciples, I've got to go, but when I go up, the Holy Spirit is coming down, and we know on the day of Pentecost that happened. And the seven stars are the pastors there. And it says, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. In this scripture and in this chapter, there's a break. There was a pattern that we had seen going through there. And the pattern in the, the first uh, or in the second chapter of Revelation was he gave accommodation first, which was kind of a compliment. But here, he doesn't do that pattern, all right? He just skips and gets right to the problem. Now, he'll, uh, uh, you know, comment and he'll, he'll compliment them later on. But if you remember, even last week, it was a compliment. It was a problem. And then it was a solution to the problem. And he says, I know you works. Folks, God knows everything about you. Jesus knows everything about you. And speaking of works... There are a lot of people that thinks their works are going to get them into heaven. And my question to you is, how do you know when you've done enough? There's always someone working harder than you are. In the Bible, and you'll see this just in a few minutes, works will not get you into heaven. I know your works, that you have a name, and that you are alive. And again, you know, the name... Uh, Sardis, there, it's, it's you, know, it, you know, when you use the word church, it is a gathering of believers. And there were Christians there. I'm not saying there were no Christians there. I'm simply saying, you know, there, there were lots of lost folks and a small group of Christians according to the Word of God. And it says, uh, uh, and that you have a name and you are alive, but you are dead. And when we think of something that's dead, folks, it has no life in. And again, there's a physical death, okay? But we all at one time were dead in our own self, our own self. Why? Because we didn't know the Lord as our personal Lord and Savior, okay? We hadn't been quickened by the Holy Spirit. And one of the best examples I can see is found uh, in Luke chapter 15 of someone dead. Luke 15, go with me if you would. And this is the story of the prodigal son, and most of us know this really well. And basically the younger son came to him and said, Father, you know, you're going to give me my inheritance later on, but I want it right now. Okay? Give me the money is basically what he was saying. So his dad did that probably uh, reluctantly, but the Bible says here that the young man went to a far country, and basically he wasted all the money. It was party time. It was have fun time. Everybody liked him because he had money, and he was sharing that money with others. But he ran out of money, and all at once he was broke, and, and he had spent everything that he had, and a severe famine came into his life, and he found out that he had nothing to purchase food with. So he got a job feeding pigs, all right? And one day he was so hungry, he looked down at that pig slop and he said, I, I think I'm going to try to chew on some of that. Here, here's a piece of corn on the cob. I'm going to finish that up. And we laugh at that and say we wouldn't do it. But folks, you've never been that hungry. 
You would do it if you were starving to death. And he sat there and he basically said, look, look at verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no, worth, no longer worthy to be called my, your son. Make me one of your hired servants. You know what I call this? A come to Jesus meeting. He realized that he had it made at his, in his house. He realized that his father wanted what's best for him. And so he asked, and, and he was going to his father to apologize to him. And then we know the story there is his father saw him way off, and he looked at his son, and he, he noticed the silhouette there, and he realized that that was his son. And he didn't stand on the porch and say, you know, you know I'm not going to speak to him. He, he took all my money, and he, he treated me rudely. The Bible says when he saw him, he ran after him. The Bible said he, he kissed him on the neck, and he kissed him, and, and his, his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight. And he told him, the, he told him his son, Dad, I'm sorry. Look at verse 22. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put on him. Put a ring and hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let's eat and be merry. For this my son was dead. Was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And I'm telling you, a celebration broke out. And an older son was sent, was in the field working. And he heard this music going on. And, and I tell you what, the older son did not have the right attitude about his brother coming home. He resented it. He would not even go up to the house. He was mad. Just read the rest of the story. And, and he just, his father come out and was trying to talk to him. And basically he was saying, I've been loyal. I've done this. I, 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 I. And then his father, look in verse 31, says, and he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. Oh, well, folks, Jesus' words here are very plain. This, this young man was not in a backslidden condition. He was lost. He was living for himself. He thought the world had more to offer him. And he went away and realized, realized, not just through his Father, all right, but through God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit that he was lost and he came to Jesus, I believe, with all my heart. And another thing about this particular story and this particular church, there is never mentioned in this, this uh, Scripture text anything about persecution. Have you noticed the four, four churches that we had studied before? It, every one of them were being persecuted. And this church was not being persecuted. And do you know why? Because they weren't doing anything for the Lord. Nothing. All that live godly in Christ Jesus, uh, First Timothy t tells us, will suffer persecution. And so here we see two kinds of people. There are lost people, and there are saved people. Let's keep reading in Revelation. Then the Bible tells us, and Jesus says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Oh, listen, folks, we need to be watchful. We need to be ready. We don't know when Jesus is coming. We have talked before that we need to be ready. Marty in the skit showed you need, you need to be ready. At any time, Jesus would come. And you look at the world and the way the world is going right now. Folks, used to, I, I would think, there were occasional mass shootings. It's almost becoming daily in our world. That is a sign of the end of times. The love of many will wax cold. 
So we need to be ready. We need to strengthen those which remain. If you are the only Christian in your family, if you are the only Christian at your workplace, if you are the only Christian at your school, you need to live a Christian life and tell others about Jesus. Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works to be perfect before God. And again, folks, nobody's perfect. He's not talking about sinless perfection. He's talking about spiritual things, spiritual things. So we see there are two kinds of people. They're saved and they're lost, and there's two kinds of responses. Look at verse 3. Jesus says, remember, remember. Oh, folks, we need to remember. Uh, Therefore, how you have received and have heard, and hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. And folks, we do not know the day or the hour, but I believe with all my heart, the next thing on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. I think that trumpet really is going to blow. I think we will look to the eastern sky, and I think we will be raptured out of this place soon. Matthew 24. Go to Matthew 24 with me if you would. Matthew 24, verse 36. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour no one knows not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus says only God knows. He knows the date. He knows that when that last person is going to be saved. It could be right here in our place. Somebody could be saved today, and God look over at Jesus and say, go get my bride. Verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, also will come Will will the coming of the Son of Man be? What was the days of Noah? Well, it says here, For in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. Folks, there are a lot of people that are ignoring signs of God. There's a lot of people that will not even pick up a Bible. There are a lot of people that will not even acknowledge that God exists or that they even remotely need to go to church. Why? Because they're living for themselves. And this is going, folks, this describes us, us as a nation. Verse 39, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. One of the verses in that story of Noah is, this, work, this, this sentence, and God shut the door. Folks, I am just telling you, if you have heard the gospel of Christ one time, that's all it takes. One time. Because really, if you think about it, the gospel is flooded in our nation. You turn on the TV any time of the day and you can find a sermon on TBN or other other you know, radios and other ways, on the computers. So we really can't say we haven't heard. And I understand the gospel has to get out to everyone, but you don't know. I mean, with all the, you know, the, the, the media and all the, the, the things that we have and ways to communicate with people, it is getting close. And it says, and took them all away, also will the coming to man be. Verse 40, and two men will be in a field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Why would he say the same thing twice? Because people aren't listening. They aren't listening. Folks, Jesus said it twice. But know this, that if the master of the house had known uh, the, at what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, 
For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. And folks, I am telling you, you know Satan's biggest lie to a lost person? You've got time. You've got time. You've got time. And folks, we don't know that. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. I want to see what you to see what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians 2 1. And you he made alive. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Before you knew Christ, you were dead. Your soul and your spirit, your body was alive, but you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world and according to the prince and the power of the air. What did you do? You did what you wanted to do. Who did you follow according to the word of God? Satan, folks. I didn't cons- when I was lost, I didn't consider God's stuff. All right? I just, and, and folks, Satan is everywhere. Man, the videos, there are like movies on TV. They're just, I mean, they show these little trailers on, on commercials. And I'm saying, it, the minute when I see the picture, I turn the channel. Folks, when there's a lady and blood is running down her face and something is coming up behind her, folks, that is satanic. These video games. And do you know, I really believe this. What we have done, even in video games, everything is make-believe. Even our kids, you know, a lot of video games, you're, you're shooting people and you're killing people. And it desensitizes us. And what Satan has done is he sold this goods to our society. The prince and the power of the air. And the spirit who now works on, in the son of disobedience, uh, of whom we also want, once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of God just as others. You know what he was saying? We, you know, there's some, some t- people that you can't tell the lost from the saved because they run around with him. They, they do the very same things. They have the same characteristics. Folks, we are in the world, but we don't need to be of the world according to this. But look at verse 4. I love this. But God. Hey, when when the word but starts a sentence, it means there's a change of thought. But God, who is rich in mercy because, uh, rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By his grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Folks, God changed our lives. The Holy Spirit came into our lives. God put the Holy Spirit in front of us, and now we don't want to sin. It doesn't mean that we won't sin, but when we sin, we know it because the Holy Spirit tells us that. And look what he says, that in the ages to come, that he might show his exceedingly riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. Those who are saved will be living with God in Jesus forever and ever and ever. And then verse 8, for by grace you have been saved. What, gra- what is grace? It's faith in God. It's belief in Jesus Christ. It's doing the right thing, knowing the right thing. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And folks, I truly believe in my own heart, the first decision I made when I was six years old, it was what I call fire insurance. I was six years old and an evangelist come to Cameron Baptist Church. And he said, and I watched him, he started with his coat on and he just started, he pulled his coat off. Halfway through, he pulled his tie off. He was preaching on hell. And his last sentence, I remember as a six-year-old, if you don't want to go to hell, you get yourself up here. Guess what I did? I ran down the aisle that day. He scared me half to death. 
And I know six years old people or kids can be saved. But folks, I'm telling you, nothing changed in my life. Then when I was 14 years old, I was in an encampment called Falls Creek. And there was a song sang on Friday night. It was called My Tribute. And the guy who wrote that and sings that was there and singing it in person. And I thought I was saved, and, and deep down inside I knew I wasn't saved. So I went to the front that night, and I prayed the sinner's prayer again. But about three months back into school, I went in, in, in my ninth grade year, I went back with the crowd that I was running with, did not think about things of God, and from that time, from 14 to 22, I was still afraid of dying. It was always on the back of my mind. And I'd hear a sermon. And folks, I can't tell you how many times from age 14 to 22, I rededicated my life. And here's something I'm personally telling you. You can't rededicate something you don't have. I'll say it again. You can't rededicate. It makes you feel better. But it doesn't take away that fear. And I am telling you, at 22 years old, Marty, I was a youth minister at Cameron Baptist Church. And Bailey Smith came through and preached a sermon on the wheat and the tares. And it didn't scare me. It made me realize that I was a lost church member. I was lost. I was on staff. And the first thought that night, the first thought Satan told me while I was standing there in that Colosseum was, what if you get fired? What if they said, we thought we had to save youth minister? And you know what I said? I don't care. I don't care if I get fired or not. I am tired of living a lie. I am tired of being afraid. I am tired of, of not knowing for sure where I went. And I'm telling you, I took my youth badge off because I was going to be one of the youth counselors. I went down front, I gave my heart and my life to Jesus, and everything changed that day. I got it! And folks, I'll be the first to say I'm a slow learner, okay? It took me three times. But the greatest day of my life was when I walked down before 3,000 500 people in a coliseum and said as a youth minister, I need Jesus. And you may not believe this, but I believe this with all my heart. If I would have died before I was 22 years old, I would have split hell wide open. Folks, he don't make exceptions for you. He doesn't make exceptions for me. And folks, I am not trying to scare anyone. I am telling you what happened in my life. And when I read this, I, I just when I read this scripture and I read this text, I said, this is a testimony of my life. So we see two kinds of people, two kinds of responses. Some say yes to Christ, others say no. And the last thing, two kinds of results. Two kinds of results. Look at verse 4. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Even in that dead church, there were a few Christians that loved God and were trying to do the right thing. And he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father uh, Father and his angels in heaven. Well, folks, if you are saved, God wrote your name in the book of life. In the book of life. And when he is talking out about not, uh, not blotting out your name, he is not saying that you can be saved and then you can be lost again. If you carefully read Revelation chapter 20, he says there, the book of life. That's everyone's name 
in what everyone has done, and He will judge. He will judge you whether you are saved or whether you're lost. You'll either go to the Bema seat as a Christian or you'll go to the great white throne judgment as a lost person. But in Revelation 21, in that, he calls it the Lamb's book of life. Read it carefully. Study it. And those are the names of the people that know Jesus Christ and are going to spend an eternity. For instance, when someone dies, even in the Roman times, the register, everyone is registered. And when they die, they mark the name off. Okay, that's talking about lost people. All right, so I'm just telling you, I believe with all my heart, and I believe Scripture says, once saved, and I like to say this, truly saved, always saved. And it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 7? I close with these two Scriptures, Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in. Why do you make wide gates? Folks, because many are, they're not going to heaven. Okay, many is what it says. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there be few that find it. Why do you make narrow gates? Because not a lot of people. And folks, I am not judging anyone here. Nobody. It's not my business to judge. But I will say, all of us are going to stand before God. All of us are going to give an account to God. And then down to verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he, do, who, he who does the will of my Father. Oh, listen, folks, you, don't, you, you can't be saved by fire insurance, okay? You can't think that my baptism or my church member, that means I'm saved. Do you know? Do you know? Are you sure that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? And it says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? prophesied is preaching, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And what, what is that? It's works. It's works. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. This is Jesus' words. Folks, I think those are the saddest words in the Bible. Those people that think they're going. And I'm telling you, there's only two people that know. It is God. You ain't fooling God. He knows. And you know. Deep down inside, you know. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So folks, it comes to one decision. Do I know? I was visiting with someone just not too long ago and I asked them the question, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And you know what they said? I hope so. Wrong answer. You're going to spend all of eternity on hope? Okay? Folks, no. These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life and that you know the Son of God. So I pray today that we would respond to the Word of God, to the Word of God. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for everyone here that has their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And God, we rejoice with those folks. But God, in a crowd this size, I know there are people struggling with their salvation experience. God, I pray that they wouldn't wait. God, I pray the minute we stand up, the minute we start uh, singing, that we will come down and we will truly give our hearts and our life to Christ. God, we don't want to be dead. We want to be alive. We want to know that you're inside of us. We want to surrender all. And God, I pray, if there's one here, and I truly believe there's more than one, 
that the Holy Spirit is telling them to come down, that they'd let go of that chair and come and give their heart and life to Jesus. God, it's the greatest decision they could ever make. So God, I pray, Lord, I, I know from experience it's a hard thing to do, but God, it's the right thing to do. So God, I pray that everyone here today would listen to the Holy Spirit and do what God tells them to do. Others may come for baptism. There's some Christians here that probably need to rededicate their life to Christ. Maybe church membership. Lord, whatever you are speaking to, God, I pray that we would hear and we would obey. God, help us not to be a dead church. And God, I pray that we are alive in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?